Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lecture 36, we're going to talk about the idea of symmetry, all right? What is a symmetry after all? Okay, now get yourself ready for some reading. Yes, Batman said that. Batman is very wise. He also has huge pecs, but I digress here. So recall that the notion of a symmetry is, first of all, a permutation. So uh, our symmetry here, we have some map sigma, which goes from a set X to a set X. And so it's a permutation, but why do we have a different word other, if we already have permutation? The idea is a symmetry is going to be a permutation that preserves the underlying structure here of the object X, in which case... I'm going to leave this deliberately ambiguous so that we can have a very diverse interpretation of what we mean by symmetry. And to try to illustrate what we mean by this ambiguous definition, underlying structure, I want to present an example, right? So imagine X is the set. It's, well, first of all, just, just, it's just a set itself. So I don't attach to it any necessary structure other than it's a set that is its collection of objects. Well, as we've studied previously in this lecture series, if you have some set X, then the so-called symmetry group is called S sub X. This is the collection of all permutations from X back into itself. If X has no other structure, then this symmetry group S sub X captures all of the so-called symmetries of, this, of the set X. So for example, if X is just the set of numbers one, two, three, four, then we would call its symmetry group S4. And when I say that it's just a set, I mean, I have no, no interpretation of these things other than it just, I have these four objects, right? One, two, three, four. And so by the symmetry group, I can take any permutation where I scramble up the one, two, three, four. So you could have like one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four, and four goes to one. That would be an acceptable symmetry of the set. Um, we could have that one goes to two, two goes back to one, three goes to four, four goes to three. That would be acceptable. You could have that one goes to two, two goes to one, three goes back to itself, and four gets back to itself. That's a symmetry. We could have as the symmetry just the identity. One goes to one, two goes to two, three goes to three, and four goes to four. These are all acceptable symmetries on this set, which again, it's just the numbers one, two, three, four. We put no structure on the set whatsoever. But maybe X does have some structure, some other structure than just being a set, right? There's something on top of it. So for example, let's take the exact same set as before, X equals one, two, three, four. But these four points could in fact just be labels of the four vertices of a square, as you see illustrated over here. So that is, we just have the four corners of a square. Then we're not gonna consider every possible permutation of X anymore because not all of those permutations would be permutations of the square. What do I mean by square, right? What I mean is there's adjacency with associated to the square, right? The number one is adjacent to two and three as if we view them as vertices of the square. And likewise, the number four, if we think of it as the fourth label of this square, then it's adjacent to two and three, but it's not adjacent to one, right? There's something different between four's relationship to number two and number three compared to its relationship with number one. Uh, that is, you don't have this adjacency relation uh, attached to one and four. Likewise, you don't have an adjacency relationship to two and three. In some regard, they're on opposite sides of the square. And the geometric or you could call it the combinatorial structure of this square, then suggest there's something different between one and four versus its adjacent pairs two and three. So we wouldn't consider all of the permutations on the set X, but only those permutations which preserve this adjacency relation. Uh, that is only those permutations that preserve the shape of the square. And of course, we've studied this in detail previously in this lecture series. The only permutations, um, of the, the only permutations that would be preserving the squareness of X is gonna be D4, which D4 was defined to be the symmetries of the square. And this kind of leads itself to other situations, right? Um, in combinatorics, one is often interested in the idea of graphs, where a graph is some collection of vertices. So you just have these points, which we could label them whatever we want. And then 
then uh, points or vertices of the graph are connected to each other by so-called edges. And then you could talk about this adjacency re relationship. So we could have something like the following. We have vertex one, two, uh, say, following the same scheme here, three and four, for which we could say that one is related to four, two is related to, to three, and that's it. If that's what we wanted, then in that situation, we would only preserve those we'd only take those permutations that preserve the structure of this X, right? What if we have an X as our shape, which is a different type of graph? Well, in this situation, you could take one and four could swap locations. Um, two and three could be left alone. In which case then, well, okay, then in that case, you just kind of switch the labels on the, the what we want to call that, the, the slant that goes from top left to bottom right. You could do that. That would give you a symmetry of the X and that would just be the one four symmetry right there. We could also swap locations of two and three. We get that, two and three. We could swap, swap locations of two and four and three, uh, two and three together, right? So you could put them together as the two, two cycle. Um, I want you to be aware that that permutation, we could talk about the switching, switching the spots, but you could also think about like, what if I kind of rotated my square? Maybe I could draw a little bit more symmetrical so it looks more like maybe like a, a cross or a plus or something like this, right? You could do like a, you know, rotation of some kind like that. Then you could think of these as like reflections and rotations, um, throw in the identity into that mix as well, in which case then we see that the symmetry type of this cross, X, plus, whatever you want to call it, gets the symmetry type of the Klein 4 group. Right, um, and then we could keep on going from this. Right, we could put my pictures back here. We could take, um, we could take. Oh, let's say that somehow one, two, and four are related to each other, but three is somewhat isolated. It's distinguished from everything else, um, and it wouldn't be so ridiculous to do something like that. But let's say that we had, um, you know, this polygon or not polygon, but this graph that did something like this, then it makes sense to be like, okay, maybe the points one, two, and four are completely interchangeable. You get this symmetry type of S3, but there's something dis something distinct about three, right? There's something different about all of it. And there again, there, there can be quite reasonable ways to make sense out of this, right? You could think of it like, oh, maybe like one, two, and four are points that live in some type of plane, right? But then... Number three was some third point that lives outside of the plane. And so it's distinguished from all the others for some reason. I don't know. Uh, and so depends on the structure of the set. And so I'm giving you some examples of geometric slash combinatorial uh, relations structure we could place on the set. But we could also be asking ourselves, what type of algebraic structure could we place on the set? One, two, three, four, right? We could ask ourselves, if I take... If I take the set one, two, three, four to be the cyclic group of order four, right? So these, these numbers are elements of a group one, two, three, four, where we'll say that one is the identity, one, two, three, four. Um, we get, and then the Cayley table is just displayed right here. We'll say that two times two is three, two times three is four, two times four is one. We'll get three times two is four, three times three is one, three times four is two. And likewise, four times two is one, Four times three is two, and four times four is three. So in particular, if you want to think of this in the added, additive sense, then multiplying by two with respect to this Cayley table is like adding one mod four. It's a Two would be the generator of this group. So we have this cyclic group of order four. Um, its Cayley table is given. So it is, it, like I said, it's isomorphic to Z4. Um, in this situation, the symmetries of X, if we view it as a group, these need to be permutations that preserve the group structure. Uh, that is that, because that's the underlying group in play right here. Well, if it preserves group structure, then we need to be, it needs to be a homomorphism. Phi of A, B needs to be equal to Phi of A times Phi of B. So we need, it's a, it's a permutation, right? We want permutations, so that means it's going to be bijective. It's going to be bijective, but we also need it to be homomorphic so it preserves the group structure. So we have a, a bijective homomorphism. That's what we normally call an isomorphism. But as this is an isomorphism from the group back into itself, in the literature, this is what's referred to as an automorphism. So morphism, like it usually means in this, set, in this setting here, it's like it's something that measures the shape. Morph means shape here. Auto actually means self. Right, so like an automobile is a self-moving object, which in the United States we usually just call that a car, right? 
But if we're looking for the symmetries of a group, then these are called automorphisms of the group. So let me kind of emphasize that. For a group structure, the symmetries are these automorphisms. Or as I was above talking about those graphs and, and, and geometric shapes before, we might talk about the automorphisms of the graph. Well, what automorphisms are there for the group? So what permutations can you, can you, what permutations allow you to move things around, but you still have the same underlying group structure that you started with? Well, in some regard, when you have the identity right here, right, we know from previous study that any homomorphism, which would include iso and automorphisms as well, any homomorphism will send the identity to itself. Kind of like I was mentioning earlier, right, with that graphical example, the number one, because it's the identity, is, is somewhat distinguishable from every other element, right? You can tell the identity apart. If I just kind of grabbed an element from random, randomly from the group, like I just imagine my group is like this bag of marbles and I just select one marble from the bag, you can tell if you grab the identity marble because of how it acts with all the other elements of the group. Also, this element three, I would also argue, is distinguishable from every other element of the group because with the exception of the identity, the element three is the only element of this group which has order two. That is, when you take the element and you square it, three times three gives you one in this situation. You can't tell that apart between two and uh, two and four, right? Now, because remember, you grab an element, so it's like if I grab a marble from my bag, there's these four marbles labeled one, two, three, four, but I don't see the label. I just have to kind of experiment with other elements. Well, okay, if I grab one element, one marble, I can multiply it by the other marbles and see, oh, it, it's acting like an identity, therefore it's going to be the identity. I can tell who the identity is. Um, with the element three right here, if I grab it, it's like, okay, I can tell that three is not the identity, but I can also tell that three has order one. Oh, this has to be the number three. I can figure that out. Because again, there's no label placed on it. We just have, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, what if we encoded like these marbles, right? What if I, what if I gave you a marble of like blue, red, green, yellow, something like that. And you have to figure out what it is, how it acts in the Cayley table. Well, you can figure out that the blue marble gives you, when you multiply by another marble, gives you the other ones. You can find out that the green marble always gives you one. But when you get like the red and yellow marble, when you look at two and th four right here, the thing is you can't tell them apart from an algebraic sense that I could interchange, I could interchange the numbers two and four on the Cayley table and there would be no loss whatsoever. Let's try it out real quick. If I just write every two, I'm gonna put a four. Every two becomes a four, like so. And then every four is gonna become a two. You get something like that, we can try this again, right? What happens? Well, one times one is one, one times four is four, one times three is three, one times two is two, that's great. Um, if I jump to the bottom here, you're gonna get two times one is one, two times four is one, excuse me, two times one is two, two times four is one, two times three is four, two times two is three, okay? Um, and then you go through all the rest of them. It's the exact same Cayley table. Now, yes, I've scrambled up the rows and columns, but that's what permutations do, don't they? They can scramble things up. But even though it's scrambled around, it's still the same. It's the same Cayley table. And so this automorphism is in fact a, it's a symmetry of the group. And so the so-called the, the so automorphism group, that is the symmetry group of this, of this group. So the automorphism group is a, is a symmetry group of groups. You're gonna get two symmetries. You have the identity, which always works, but you also have this relabeling. Why does it say one, three? That should say, Sorry, that should say two, four. One and three are distinguishable there. Two and four are the permutations we can move around. But we could also consider like the Klein four group, for example, that's a group of order four. And so maybe we take it as like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right? So the identity will be, two, will be one. And then everyone else is gonna be order two. So when you square it, you get one. So you're gonna have, and the way the Klein four group ha has, when you have the elements which are non-identity, when you multiply them together, you always get the other element. So two and three gives you four, two and four gives you three, uh, three and two gives you four, three and four gives you two, four and two gives you three, and four and three gives you two, like so. And so with this Cayley table, if I kind of lost the labels, you'd still be able to tell the identity is the identity because when you act on it by any other element, you would get uh, that element back. But the thing is when it comes to two, three, and four, if I relabeled them, to, if I relabeled the two, threes, and fours, you get the exact same group back again. 
And so while the automorphism group of, say, Z4, this is just isomorphic to Z2, you only have the identity in that, that two cycle. When it comes to the automorphism groups of the Klein 4 group here, right, this actually gives you S3 because you could take any permutation of of any permutation of the elements two, three, four, and that would give you back the same group again. So when we view X as a set, we got the symmetry just to be S4, okay? Because there was no structure to it. When we viewed it as a square, we got the dihedral group, D4, which is also a subgroup of S4, mind you, right? Um, and we could take a different shape or a different graph attached to it, just attach sort of a geometric meaning to it. And we get these other symmetry groups, which are based upon the geometry of the set. When we viewed X as a cyclic group, then the symmetry the symmetries turned out to be isomorphic to Z2, um, which would be the automorphism group. This is also, right, Z2 is a subgroup of S4. Um, if we thought of it as the Klein 4 group, you get S4, which S4 can also be, excuse me, S3, which can also naturally be viewed as a subgroup of S4. So in this manner, when we consider the symmetry group of an object, we need to focus not just on the elements which create the object, but also the relations between the elements that capture the aspects of what we're focusing on. Is this set combinatorial? Is this set topological? Is this set geometric? Is this set algebraic? Is this set number theoretic? What have you. And so these sets often have structure to it. Is this an ordered set? Is it a partially ordered set? Just to name a few examples, right? Is this a partition? This set has structure. And so as we talk about symmetries, the symmetry group of a set, it depends on the underlying structure, geometric, algebraic, what have you. And so when you focus on those aspects, you'll be able to determine what type of symmetries am I concerned about. But in all aspects, the symmetries will always turn out to form a group.